Hi everyone. Welcome to another episode of From the Bottom Up with David and I. <laughs> I don't know if you can see David, how the camera is set up, but he's up there in um, Angel's Landing because um, he's going to be coming down tomorrow and he's helping with the Mystery School and I've come down here. So yeah, I guess I'll just get right into the topic that I want to go into, as usual, from from the bottom up. Something happened to me, so I can never plan for the show. Something happened to me last night that feels like it's, um, yeah, it's striking a chord. And so I want to really explore that. And a little bit of context, I guess we had a... Um, we just had a talk at the mystery school about going into some of the dynamics for everybody to just get into function and, and be happy and some things just played out in the room where I was just noticing things and speaking to them like, okay, could somebody be on the lights? So when the movie pauses, I will, um, you know, they can see me with the microphone and we had just the day before given everybody full permission to basically let the new participants take over the monastery and make their mistakes so to speak and have lots of fun and just practice and the residents were really to be speaking to um, communication, be freed up fully for communication so I was up there doing the communicating and then even at one point one of the participants said can um, can we stay in the movie and skip preparing dinner, or should we go and prepare dinner? And I said, okay, who's one of your who's your resident, who's your overseer to pray with? Because we're wanting everybody to get into this prayer. And I have this feel I have this huge mission right now within the ministry to kind of turn over communication. Where I've said it a few times, the elders have been making these decisions and then sharing them, and everybody kind of carries them out and practices listening and following and and now it's like wanting to turn where everybody's feeling like from from the bottom up they get this opportunity to really pray what they feel then share it and join with others and collaborate and and kind of give us the gift and we can just yeah that's that's a great idea or allow some of the elders to just kind of step into more of the mystic and some can even just relax and we've been lightly saying going go to pasture, <laughs> you know, just <laughs> not being so involved in the logistics. And it feels really good. The whole thing just feels really good. So in this opportunity that was presented yesterday, you know, the residents weren't really speaking up to the opportunities that were presented by the participants. And so I did it. But then we had this big meeting afterwards and with just the residents and Lisa and I, and didn't know how to really talk about this is an opportunity for you to really go into this without using specifics and so I did use specifics and it felt like energetically in the room first we had to go through well what you do comes from what you think and when you're aligned with the Holy Spirit you'll naturally be in the communication flow but when you're thinking with the ego you know you'll you'll be missing communication opportunities because when I was first addressing it people started feeling wrong and but I didn't know, and you told us yesterday we didn't have to do anything. And, and basically, I just I let it pour out and ended up, at least and I had this two-hour talk that was really, in some ways, firm. And it's this, and it's this, and da 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 And I gave stories about David working with me over the years, like up at Nam, when we were traveling around the world. And I was really going to learn how to be a better speaker. And on that tour, at one point, David might not have the same perspective on this, but David looked at Francis and Kirsten, and some of us are meant to be public speakers. And he looks at the two of them, and then, in my perspective, he looked over at me, and some of us are not. <laughs> and, I, and something in me was, was devastated. Like, here I am, the whole purpose of me being on this tour was to learn to be a better speaker. So I made a conclusion, okay, I'm not going to speak. So the next gathering... I didn't speak and didn't have anything to say. And then in the middle of it, Dave was like, Jason, do you have anything you want to say? But I was so not in the preparation mode or anything. 
I was kind of like this, and I had to, okay, next gathering, I'm going to be speaking. So I got all ready. When I thought I had something to say, I walked up to the, the front of the room and was ready to grab the mic, and David like took the mic, probably involuntarily, and moved it as far away from me as I could, <laughs> so there's no way I was going to grab that microphone. And I'm like, oh, I'm not supposed to be speaking. Okay, I'm not going to speak. So the next gathering, I'll prepare it, I'm not going to speak. Hey, Sin, do you have anything to say? And it was this constant back and forth because, you see, in, in speaking, when I thought I was supposed to, there's a concept that's painful. And in deciding I'm not going to speak, there's like a repression of, of like a responsibility or, okay, I'm, I'm not going to. And the concepts have to arise. And so the mind is constantly going to be going like this with the Holy Spirit after you've trusted like, for example, in the initial stages, integrity is such that, you know, the behavior has to line up with what people are saying because everybody associates integrity with behavior. So a teacher-student relationship, there's lots and lots of, we would say, Hawkeyes. Okay, are they going to be consistent with what it is they're, they're saying? And there is all of that. But you end, eventually reach a point where actually what you do does line up with what you think but to the student, it might seem like there's this going back and forth. That's just because there's a deeper call to wash away an unconscious that has not been seen, and so the ego will judge against it. So I was giving these kinds of talks, and I might be answering my own question, <laughs> but, but I had this feeling like the end of the meeting that even though people were kind of grateful, some were just wondering what happened, that my heart didn't fully expand and I was left with this feeling like why am I the one still pointing these things out and going through it and and wondering if there was a deeper lesson for me that I, that's not for me anymore because in the ministry maybe three four or five years ago I felt like I got to this point and made a decision that's as far as I'm going I can't get through this wall and here I am now back in so fully with everything that in some ways I don't even have a choice because there's no way the communication and the gifts that we've been given will be passed on unless I speak to it. And yet, I don't know how to get through this place where my heart doesn't just explode with the gratitude for these opportunities to speak to it. So I'm, I'm hoping this can be a beginning of an inroads to some subtleties of what's going on with this. So yeah, David, if you have any thoughts. <laughs> Oh, beautiful. Well, it's, <clears throat> I think it was a Buzz Gag song was coming to mind. Uh, you can't get what you want till you know what you want. And, and I think a lot of us are, are really aware, like they've done studies in hospitals um, where basically they do all these studies with placebos and everything. And basically the, the, the patients that are seemingly sick the ones that want to heal, heal. The ones that don't want to heal remain sick. And actually, Bernie Siegel has even looked into it a little further. The ones that want to die, die. And the ones that want to die fast, die fast. The ones that want to die slow, go to hospice and die slow. The ones that want to die with friends and family and loved ones around them, die with friends and family and loved ones around them. The ones that are afraid of intimacy and embarrassed by dying, they slip out at 2, 3, 4 in the morning with nobody around. It's, the mind is so powerful, so really the central question always comes back, back to like those levels of mind. What's the desire? What's, what's the prayer of the heart? So initially, you've been working on this flow of support thing and, and the turning now for the participants you know, to really take more responsibility for their thoughts and their state of mind and for their activities and their function and for the residents to come in now instead of doing so many things to be more as consultants or communicators you know there to offer helpful tips and everything and so it's like a system you know where you flip it and this is the time but ultimately the real question that only ever has to be answered is is what do i want in other words, you know, you've made an artificial category of participants and residents, but, but in meeting with the, 
the residents are meeting with the participants, the first question should be, okay, who's in, who wants some healing here? You know, you, you got to wait to see which hands go up. Okay, mm -hmm. who wants those five hands that went up? You can stay in the room. The rest of you can are dismissed. Because why? Because you're working with healing and you're working with the desire for healing and you're working with those who want to heal. In other words, another way of asking the question is, why is everybody here? Who's here for healing? Hands go up. Okay. Uh, the rest of you, you can leave right now. <laughs> it's like, uh, uh, if, if you came to volunteer, if you came to spend some time here and uh, do some skills and help out and do a little bit of service and this and this, the context of healing is the most important. And it's almost, it's, you could say the same thing with the participants. Many of the participants are going through these huge, and they're going through a healing thing. And, and when they signed up to come here, they not only signed up to come for heart openings, for healings and so forth, but they had all these talks and interviews all along to make sure they're really still yeah. wanting what they said they wanted at the beginning. Some of them signed up many months in advance. So there's these little touch base things like, are you with me? Are you, do you still, are you in it? Oh, I've got some fear coming up, but are you in it? Are you, are you really in it with me? That's, that's the way to keep the vibrancy. Because mm. I remember years ago, um, just in the context of me just living a simple mystic life and praying, studying, doing the course, practicing my lesson, going about on my miracle assignments all throughout the day and everything, that when people started showing up, very strange for me when people started showing up and going, wow, you are happy and I want to uh, live with you or I want to be your student or whatever. I wasn't really looking for that. I wasn't actually thinking about students. So I didn't have that thought in my mind. And then when they started to congregate, you know, then you have, before you know it, you've got a room full of students and didn't even plan to have any. And then out of those, I would really be in that place where I would wait for that group of students. Let's say there's seven, eight, nine students. I would wait for the students to approach me and make their, their plea or their call or their desire for healing in the sense that wait for them to come up and say, listen, if you see anything at all, I'm doing the mind watching and the mind training with the course as best I can, but if you see something that, that is helpful to point out what I'm clinging to, what I'm still attached to, what I'm holding on to, what defense mechanisms I have. If you see something that, that is blocking me from healing, please, would you point that out to me? I would wait for them to come to me and ask me to point things out for them. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't even assume that just because there are a bunch of students in the room that, that I was then the teacher and I could point out anything I wanted to point out. I would even wait among the students for them to come because some of the students would come and would say, please help me, join your mind with me, point out anything you see, and the others would not. They would kind of sit back almost in a passive way uh, like I was going to lecture to them or I was going to transmit something to them through words or something. Mm. But the, the key lesson is always that when the mind desires to heal, it heals. And the mind desires other things in the world more than healing, then the process of healing seems to go very slow. And there's actually quite a lot of resistance to mm. the healing. And you can't really overcome resistance. It's like the mind that has the resistance has to acknowledge the resistance and then acknowledge that they want peace of mind or joy or happiness more than the resistance. And that's where the, vib the vibrancy you're talking about, where, where you feel like this, ooh, this juicy vibrancy where everybody's in it together. It's all one lesson, but everyone's practicing that same lesson. We're all on the same page. We're all practicing together. There, there has to be that actual willingness and actual invitation for 
the healing to occur. Without the, the willingness, without the invitation, then, then there's some kind of a block, and you could say the mind would rather not heal mm. than heal. And that's the definition of a split mind. And when the mind is teetering over there and still having this strong desire not to heal, to keep the status quo, to maintain some kind of position, to maintain some kind of role, to maintain the world, basically the distorted world, if that is still in force, then there's nothing you can do. In fact, that's not your lesson. You're not, you can't be invasive. You can't uh, insert yourself into an atmosphere or an environment where there is a fear of healing. And, and so that's, that's where I, I think people like Steve Jobs, you know, I was talking about his, the way he would run meetings. He was so on top of everything that he, he would go there, he'd sit down in the boardroom and he'd look around at everybody in the room and, and he would intuitively know who was supposed to be there, who wasn't. And if somebody was interjecting themselves, or I'm sure he could even feel it by looking around the room. There's some people that were like, oh, it's Monday morning, and listen, I don't even want to be in this room. Maybe they're twiddling their pencil or mm. doing something, and he could pick it up. So he would probably do that little sort every day. Like, I just want those that are really with me to be here with me. Mm. And, and for those that aren't, it's not like he's casting them out. It's just like, they're just not ready for what's given in the moment. And that's okay too. You know, there's no, nobody's, there is no in and out in heaven. It's just like what serves in the moment. What's, what's really the prayer? The prayer of the heart has to really be for healing. And we have to keep reminding of our, ourselves of that in order for the flow of support to support Jesus and support the Spirit. We have to keep our hearts open and we have to keep the prayer uh, very strong for healing wow because this could go either way so then okay so then what do i do what's practical like if you see all these things and like do you do i just keep speaking like for the lights and all that stuff i guess i can just speak into it but then there's this maybe an inner frustration like why isn't somebody else picking up on this and then is it just my lesson to look at the frustration then and not teach what i would learn so there's no frustration <laughs> It's funny, if I just voice it, it's crazy. Well, yeah, I think, I think that's where the prayer of teach what I would learn. Like, I look at my life with a course. The course came into my life, let's say, 32 years ago. And then for the first five or seven years, it was more of a, me working with Jesus and the Holy Spirit in the course, you know, in a very direct way and then and then I started to go out and go to some groups and then then I think actually after those maybe seven years or so then people started showing up and so I started to be in what seemed to be community settings and still that was just a phase leading to another two and a half decades of traveling speaking living with people sharing in community and so on and so forth and I do know that through a lot of those early years, uh, I would see that the Spirit would be speaking through me, but I would repeat things quite often. I, you know how the Course says, infinite patience yields immediate results. Um, I, I would just give it over to the Spirit, and the Spirit would repeat these things. And, and anybody who's been a parent, maybe with a small child, uh, like mothers know that you have to repeat things over and over, sometimes hundreds of times. But, but who's counting, really? I mean, it's, if, if they are counting, how many times do I have to tell you, you know, that's where it gets, the anger comes up, the frustration. I don't, I don't really want to be your parent, or why don't you, why did you even come as a child to me? You know, there's all kinds of ego d dynamics that can arise. But in terms of spiritual circles, when I would travel around and I would go to all these different groups and all these different states and countries, I would practice just showing up and occasionally I would have to repeat something to the host or it just came out very gentle, but sometimes there were these gentle reminders that were repetitive and then um, it, it is washing away even the idea of what it means to be a person 
in a spiritual community or an elder in a spiritual community, all those are just self-concepts too that have to get rinsed. And so there can be a, there can be a bit of that where there's things that need to come through as reminders, I would say, over and over. But eventually, you know, that just washes the mind to the point where you're more ready for the silence and where even those things of, of working with people and everything, those are just metaphors and concepts along the way too. Those start to get rinsed as well. And then you're drawn into deeper and deeper states of silence. So it, everything has its place. And, it, and I think it's good just to be in this kind of context, just to be patient where, where you're not like watching your watch and going, okay, how many, how many minutes or hours or years do I have to go through this uh, giving directions, giving instructions, because as long as you're really counting the time and watching the clock, uh, you know, it, can, it still can be the ego, you know, getting in there, holding on to that concept of time and, and ultimately of persons. Okay, so then, again, okay, so then, because I joined with you before I went into that meeting, and it felt good for me to stay for the meeting, what, what's the lesson then if, if basically the core of my message, even though I delivered lots of <laughs> cool things, <laughs> what, <laughs> if the core of it was coming from this energy, what was the purpose of the meeting then f for me? Like to, I don't even know if you well, can answer. It's, it's more, again, miracles are involuntary, so what you want is just to be in that involuntary flow of spirit, use me. You know, you want to be in that flow of, I'm here to be only truly helpful, I'm here to serve, I'm here in, to be in the joy, and then as you do that, then that's, that is the purpose right there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's the, the reason miracles are involuntary and should not be under conscious control is because as soon as you're looking with your, your eyes and you're, you're looking for results or you're looking for the script to go a certain way or you're looking for certain outcomes, then that's actually where the... Uh, the struggle comes in. That's where the doubts, it's kind of a version of that part in the manual for teachers, you know, should healing be repeated? And basically Jesus is saying, as long as you're concerned about outcomes or concerned about symptoms or concerned about the form, then you need to come back inside and you need to be healed. It's not about the form having to look a certain way. That's where the the ego comes in, and that's where the expectations come in, and that's where the frustration and struggle comes in. You simply are there to be done through, to deliver a message, and then be very happy that you've fulfilled your function, not to, to judge the, the outcome. message is maybe just like, okay, care for your pods, but as soon as you swing into the specifics, it's like that, yeah, delivering the inner. Yeah, it's interesting. There's something... Because I was actually open to you going the total the other way with this, like, like, because one of the things that happens to me is with this sort of filterless state that I'm practicing some discernment <laughs> with, it's like, I, I end up saying thoughts that I don't really believe, and it feels like other people f feel wrong, and I can't tell if that's just part of the spirit voicing things that need to be released and healed in the moment because I feel so much love with them, and I feel like, especially that they love me, like there is a deep connection, a trust, otherwise I don't think that would even come for most. And yet, yeah, is that really my job to even say those things? Because I almost already can hear it coming, and then I'm like, oh, I know the reaction, but is that part of the healing process, to voice things that need to be exposed, or does it mean I still believe in it somewhere? I know it's, I'm really opening up where we're going with this. <laughs> it's kind of a common thing, and I'm kind of tired of people feeling like I make them wrong, because it's not, not my heart, it's not my direction, but it's, it's like the thoughts are there, and I, yeah. yeah. I think where it's all heading is just like uh, when a realized being comes and gives a talk in a, in a hall, uh, there may be many, many reactions in the hall, 
Um, some of my early my training videos that I loved the most was uh, watching Christian Murdy give a talk. I remember there one time he was giving a talk in San Diego and came out for I think maybe about an hour. And I swear every five minutes, he was so deep. He was so penetratingly deep. He was so uncompromising. He was going at undoing fear forever. That was his topic for the night. And he was going to do it in about an hour. And every five minutes, they would do panning through the audience. And people, you could just see like they, they lost him. He, he would lose another 200, 200 people um, every time they would do a pan around the audience. Every, every pan around the audience, he lost another 200 people. That's be just because it was so deep. But I think the lesson in that was he was like a broadcasting uh, instrument. He was like a, a broadcasting tower, broadcasting this beautiful, clear message of awakening and actually broadcasting the steps and then stopping every five minutes and say, are you with me? Are you with me? He was all excited. Are you with me? And then he would say, don't take what the speaker says to be the truth. Find that for yourself. Then go on another five minutes and lose another 200. I absolutely adore that because us, uh, actually, whether anybody could follow him or not, the joy was in the transmission. Mm. He was, his eyes were twinkling. He was excited the whole mm. hour. He was broadcasting. And I think part of it is a very subtle undoing of the beliefs. Like you, when you say, oh, I'm, you could feel the thoughts coming to be delivered. And then you're saying, I know the reaction. You just have to be willing to let go of what that even means. I know the reaction. You're not meant to be an evaluator of mm. reactions. You're meant to be a transmitter of joy, a transmitter of peace, a transmitter of happiness. And where this is all leading is, as you go deep enough into being the joyful transmitter, like Krishnamurti was a tremendous example of that, that's leading to releasing the actual belief that there is an external world mm -hmm. that you're transmitting to somebody, mm -hmm. that there's somebody out there in the world that's listening to you. I mean, the more you go fully into the transmission from the Holy Spirit, it will be an experience of singular mind, of one-mindedness, mm -hmm. and that there is no audience. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's pretty freeing. If, mm -hmm. if you're simply delivering what the Holy Spirit is giving you to deliver in the joy and in the happiness, and there's no audience to receive it, it's simply for a washing of your mind and to come back into that alignment with source, mm -hmm. then that's where things get very gleeful. And mm -hmm. also where, you know, the idea of, of people pleasing completely vanishes. The idea of, of um, trying to get people to react a certain way or um, believing there's people out there that, that like what you're saying and don't like what you're saying. All those things just kind of get washed away. And as a contrast to Krishnamurti, I can share, you know, I love that Ram Dass story where he's, he's up and he's telling all these exagger exaggerated, dra dramatic stories. And the more he tells, Ram Dass tells his dramatic stories, it's like the people in the audience are eating out of the palm of his hand. They're getting more engaged with every dramatic story that he tells. And he's doing fine because he's got the whole audience eating out of his hand. And then finally he, he looks back in the back of the room and there's a lady in the corner that's just knitting. Oh. And she's just back there knitting and she's just smiling, very steadily smiling, no loud exclamations, nothing. Wow. And the more he sees her in the back of the room just knitting there and smiling, he gets more angry and more frustrated that there's actually somebody in the room who's not eating out of the palm of his hand. He gets up out of the chair, he goes all the way back to the back of the room. He goes up to the woman and he, he pretty much screams at the woman who's knitting. Who's, she's sitting there smiling and he's like, what is it? Aren't you even paying attention to my stories here today? And, and she's just kept knitting and smiling still and he's like, what is it? 
Finally, he's like, what is your pathway? What is your pathway? Who, who, what is it? Who are you following? Because I think he wanted a Ram Dass follower, and this was just a knitting lady. And finally, he pulls it out of her. She just smiles, and she goes, I knit. That's all she said. <laughs> she didn't even say Ramana Maharshi or, or Yogananda or something. I knit. You know, oh, he, and for all it was really was for Ram Dass, it was the undoing of pride in him believing he was a spiritual leader. That's what that whole story was about. And, and it was kind of an extreme story, but again, I, I, I tell that story juxtaposed with Krishnamurti, you know, who literally could care less. Uh, if there was somebody knitting mm. in the room and smiling, he wouldn't have even noticed it. <laughs> he wouldn't have even noticed it because he was such in a state of presence and love that, uh, you know, he, he would, he's not quite concerned about who's receiving the message or not. So, so these are really important little parables about getting at the main idea, that the main idea is the presence, is to mm. be in the presence. That's what the whole thing is for. And that's what healing is, is to be in alignment with Source and, and in the presence of God's that's love. That's very deep. I can feel it because I feel sometimes very, very happy with these, these gatherings, and it feels like they're in it with me, and I can't tell if it's just, if after you're telling this parable, if that's just presence and we're all together or there's like some still concept there of okay we're all okay they're with me so now I I feel good this is wow wow <laughs> it's kind of spirits bringing you in here you are doing your your uh, from the bottom up TV show and then you know it's basically we're just transmitting but maybe one day it'll be like uh, Ellen or Oprah, where you have a live studio audience, and then, <laughs> and then you, get to, you know, like they have with the Tonight Show and whatever, you have a live, and they they're going to react however they're going to react, and you start to really see that you have no control over the world <laughs> with a live audience. You know, Oprah could tell you some stories, I'm sure. Johnny Carson, all of them. Jay Leno can tell you what the lessons they learned with having a, a live studio audience. There's a it's the same thing. They yeah. really have to learn to be tuned in and, and to not be concerned about what the people yeah. think, Crazy. say, do. Yeah, yeah and I, I'd like to build on this idea you, you said, because yeah, we had our meeting, uh, elders meeting a few days ago and going through this turn and everybody kind of being on the same page and at the end of the meeting, you know, it ended and then some people said some more things and I was walking away because I had to move on and you just said something, what you just repeated, which was, remember Steve Jobs and who's in the room, it's got to be in the room. And this, it was really, I really took notice to that. And when Suzanne and I went out, I repeated, that is my lesson with this whole thing. So with that, I've just been kind of watching some nuances because I feel that I have this kind of all-inclusive nature where I want everybody in so that Everybody can hear it. Everybody can feel safe. And then we don't have to update everyone. They can go out and carry the message. But, but then those certain people are very distracting to the meeting. It's like some kind of energetic pull. And I, I can't tell if I'm just supposed to be more firm with like ignoring them, <laughs> ignoring them or have them leave. But what happens is afterwards, the meeting, let's say I don't have them in, they say things like, why, you didn't include me, I didn't know, and they, they unconsciously go against the direction, and you have to update them anyways. And so I'm like, there's a no-win scenario here, so there's got to be something deeper with, how does this actually work? Yeah. 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 Well, I think it's, it's the state, I mean, I always like that book, uh, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance by Robert piercing but basically in their phaedrus and a lot of the teachings it was always going for quality so let's say that quality and healing are synonymous they're the same quality and healing are the same and then anything that's not quality or it's not healing and it's not true integrity of the mind that's another synonym for quality healing integrity of the mind then it really is of no concern to you whatsoever uh, oh. so, so you can just kind of 
let anything else go. And basically, uh, people have said, well, how does this work for you? How does this work with, with groups? How does it work with organizations and whatever? And it goes back to what Jeff was talking about. Um, he was referring to, um, back to the, the last step show where Frank was saying, you know, actually he said, I'm, I'm over here, meaning over in Europe, and, and I'm not there in the community. So he was, Frank was saying, it it's, seems harder. It's harder to be over here than being there. Because it's like I get little calls and little snippets, but then I got to face my mind where the resistances are and everything. And then Jeff was making the point that I had told Jeff at one point, well, actually community is just a state of mind. And, and that's where this is all heading. That's where the quality reaches the peak. When, when you start to realize that community is a state of mind, that quality is a state of mind, and integrity is a state of mind, healing is a state of mind, and that's it, period. Nothing else but that. Then you start to really relax and go, oh my gosh, this is the lesson. I, I, I was still trying to deal with this other thing that I was perceiving. But if I'm perceiving this other thing, distractions or uh, whatever, uh, an opposing force on the machine or whatever you want to call it, then, then I must still have an investment in, in seeing it, perceiving it, because if I'm still perceiving it in my awareness, then I must still value it. And in the end, you value quality, you value healing, you value community as a state of mind. What does that, how does that play out? Well, I've, had, I've been part of many seeming spiritual communities over the years, been into many households all over the world, spoken at conferences, in ashrams. I'm, I've been all over the place. I've spoken in castles and well, you know, just, at least it's all been on this planet. I haven't been to the moon or anything or another planet yet, but that's just right now. But, but basically I've done all these different things for we'll say three decades. And then out of all that, what seemed to be the people who are kind of around me, living around me and everything, uh, you know, now we've got, let's say there's 30 some people that seem to be part of interacting, living together, what we call Living Miracles Community. Well, like that old show, 30 something, let's say the, the Living Miracles Community is 30 something. And then, then there's about maybe 100 that are engaged with us in a pretty regular way, like online retreats. And whenever we do something, a retreat out of that hundred, there's like a hundred. So there's like 30 something. And then there's a hundred something orbiting outside of that 30 something. And what Jeff was saying, it's all a state of mind. Really, they're all the same too. It's just, it seems in time in the vertical dimension that there are those that are surrounding in a configuration that are on the same kind of vibe of waking up. But there's like a purpose or a vibe that's running through the 30 something. And then there's another kind of vibe that's like, oh, we're coming, we're with you, we're with you, we want to come as close as we can, we're terrified, but we want to come as close as we can in the hundred something. And that's like the vibe that's going around there. And then outside of the hundred something, there's, there's a vibe that are people like, yeah, I don't like what they're doing. I wouldn't go near the 30 something or the hundred something with a 10 foot pole. I, I'll stay on the sidelines and watch that. I'm not getting involved. And then beyond that, there's the realm of the indifferent, the ones that don't know of any of this. <laughs> They're so caught up into the, the world and competition and striving and jobs and family dramas and all this myth that, that they're living what? <laughs> it's like awakening what? You know, they, they have no thing. And yet, the whole thing, including that other, they're all part of the community of the mind. That when you're in the joy of your purpose, you feel, you feel it in the 30-something, you feel it in the 100, you feel it in the, the ones that are disbelief, the, the non-believers, and then you feel it even with the ones that are all caught up in the dramas of the world. They're all, they all become the same in the community of the mind. Because they all are the same, there's only one mind. Where are they going to be if they're not truly all really in your mind, in the one mind? Then that would make no sense at all. 
it's not like there's really private minds, private thoughts, multiple dimensions, all these things that are so-called part of the religions and spiritual journeys. They're all hallucinations. And once you get into that vibe of your joy, your alignment, your attunement, then everything comes into alignment with the community of the mind that Jeff was talking about. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's what's so important about this. That's, it's really saying you're going for that quality that mm-hmm. connection, that joy, and you're putting your full mind focus into that. And mm-hmm. that's exactly where it belongs, not on distractions or managing people or who's in, who's out. In the end, you know, Jesus would use things like, are you, are you with me? Meaning, are you coming into the state of mind that is our Christ mind? Mm-hmm. And he never put a lot of focus and attention on the ones that weren't because he knew that you might say that the salvation was the only game happening in it all. That's the only game worth your attention is the game of salvation. It's still a game, it still involves teaching, learning, and time, but, but it's a salvation game. It's a, it's a healing game. It's an awakening game. And the other games are really all part of that too. Even though people may claim they're not. It, it is all really part of this, the awakening game when you want it to be so. That's beautiful. Yeah, you, I, everything you said is kind of summed up. I don't know, my drive back last night from the monastery, because I, I had these feelings, like, what happened? And when I was waiting for an answer about halfway through the drive, I just felt this message of, well, they're all your mind, meaning the residents. So it's not that you did did do anything wrong or spoke without an invite basically or or that you did it right it was almost like this is my training ground but not even the people the, my mind and so it's it just felt so innocent and and in that it's not so much about right or wrong it's like just keep going deeper it was really cool so it summarizes your whole yeah, yeah. Your whole, it's yeah. beautiful <laughs> you got a download on the forgot the about hour it, and a half <laughs> This is a replay. <laughs> we're letting we're letting all our beloveds uh, watch the show today yeah. and get a replay yeah. of your download. Well, we could um, maybe we could open it up a bit here and just see if, especially if anybody has anything on this topic, that would be my first priority. And if not, we can move on to total other topics. You did. You just raise your virtual hand or your hand. I can only see five windows, but others might see you. So. Esther, go ahead, else? Esther. Hi. This is so good because this has been my life long journey is what did I say? What did I say? You know, like um, I said something wrong I, 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 and I didn't know what to focus on when I would speak to someone. I still have struggling with this like um today i had a call from uh or yesterday i had a call from a guy that used to drive me around he's a cab driver and i really needed his help and i had the money then and um he still calls me as if i still could use him and i wanted to be like um presence and and um after the call he, well, he said, Esther the Great, you know, and I'm like, I never felt comfortable when he would say that, but I would feel like the ego was happy about it, you know, and, and so I, that's how the conversation started, and, and, and I said in response, thinking ahead, well, I'll call me Andy the Great and see how that goes, and then uh, feeling, um, like, feeling how that felt, and so I'm, I'm not clear, uh, like how to hold purpose this 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 now I'm learning from you guys today the quality and the and the if you could help me with this um <laughs> <laughs> just this this goes on I mean, you know all my life this has been after the fact I, I hash out what happened and how I feel is usually not very good and and the guilt and all this and I'd rather know what to focus on so this is great um, so what's my question? You um, might hear it underneath. 
Yeah. <laughs> I, feel, I feel it, Esther. Like, like, to give you an example, like, here we have, we're doing this mystery school, and we're, like, about a little bit past two-thirds of the way through the mystery school now, which, as long as you have unconscious fears and doubts, you you bet the ego will second guess what you said, what you did. It will always try to to uh, make you feel bad um, by second guessing everything. And so we had the whole group show up at the the first day of this month, and then the first uh, couple days and the weekend was an orientation, and then there's a little bit of a settling down, and there's it's a working through lots of fear and allowing, giving yourself permission to start to let those emotions up because I'd say a good majority of the ones who came to this mystery school, they were not in touch with their emotions and they would probably tell you, yeah, I don't even want to get into that uh, that dark ball of wax or whatever that's down there. Um, that's why I'm into denial and repression. But by about halfway through the mystery school, all kinds of emotions, it's like a geysers and uh, it's like shooting volcanic lava shooting up because they feel the safety of starting to get in touch with their, their emotions. And then now the period that Jason has been describing is when people start to take on more in terms of the mind training, in terms of the function and task. So just what you're asking is really what's happening at the mystery school. It's a, it's a process of developing trust. It's a process of allowance to get in touch with your darker emotions in a, in a context of safety. It's an allowance of, to express, to not try to push down and hold on to those, let them, them up. And then it's more of a movement in a very shared way of, of getting into purpose or function. And I know, Esther, you're very much a part of the, uh, the online retreats and and always sending in your questions and comments. And so you're, in one sense, you're like a, a participant that's doing it more virtually, but you're doing the same thing that these uh, mystery school participants are doing. You're just spacing it out uh, there from your, your home on, in the East Coast, and with your own willingness and your own desire, you're, you're doing the same thing. So really... What we're talking about is is one topic, but but that gives you a little bit of the context that you're participating in um, with your willingness, with your desire for healing. So that's what's happening, and you just you do have to keep the faith and stay persistent with it in order to you know make it all the way through. Thank you, Esther. Oh, she's got her <laughs> she's got her one more thing going. <laughs> Okay, so so what happens is in the background, I have this fear that he's going to go rogue, and 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 or anybody that I find meet out out of my circle that I would stay friends with on the phone or whatever, that they would go rogue on me like they hear on the news, and and um, so I feel like I'm coming from that, and and that's so that's. Mm. I don't, I have a deep, it's a deep thing, this, this, this fear that it seems like it's pervasive within me. Like it's, I don't know. Just. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's basically uh, part of the self-concept that, that the prayer you're saying is I want to let go of this self-concept. Um, even spiritual teachers, I know there was a pretty famous spiritual teacher who, who used to have uh, somebody go and before she would talk at a church, she would have somebody go and, and kind of uh, smudge and douse and bless the entry point uh, because if she was afraid somebody would come there and go rogue on her. And so she wanted to make sure that she was completely protected before she'd go into these churches. And there are a lot of politicians, for example, I just read today that there's like, these political races that are now, and then people from the families of the politicians are coming out for the opposing uh, person who's running. <laughs> That's like having a family member go rogue on you in the middle of a public election. 
So it's all part of a self-concept that there's something dangerous out there that may come back to bite you. And I would say that you want to practice this love and this forgiveness so thoroughly that if anybody ever showed up at your door or whatever, you would be more likely to just pray, call on the Holy Spirit, and turn into Mother Teresa in the face of the rogue. And you would take the stranger in. That's what Jesus says. Take the stranger in. When that rogue stranger shows up, your love would overcome the rogueness. <laughs> and and because really it's a call for love. And you would, you're working doing the inner work so you can deliver that love even during extreme cases or we could say emergency cases. You want to be able to deliver that love. So that's that's really the answer. <laughs> Thank you, Esther. Thanks, David. And we got AC now, I think that is yep, a question. AC's up. Go ahead, AC. Yep, AC is up. Go ahead, AC. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's, <laughs> it's like I've never left the community today. <laughs> I'm I'm totally with you and, and can see how much everything is all in my mind. Everything that I'm upset about or have been. All the assumptions, the interpretations, the, the, the doubt, the fear, everything is, has been just my thoughts, just my beliefs. It have nothing to do with who I am or who they are or anything. And I feel so, so alive and so welcoming and appreciative and everything. So it doesn't matter what happens in form or where I am or where I'm invited to be, it's it's all it's all happening just as it should. <laughs> Thank you so, Thank you. so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, AC. Yeah. We love you and you're with us every single day and every moment of every day. And and some people here at the monastery were asking, like, how did you guys end up in Utah? And AC was actually with a whole group. There's this group of us there in Cincinnati, and and when we were contemplating making the big move to Utah, which um, actually AC was quite familiar with, uh, she she had spent quite a bit of time in Utah. She was there. She was like, "Here, I'll make a donation." I'll. So she's one of the ones that has helped us uh, over the years. The Lilas, the ACs. That there have been so many of the Suzannes that, that actually allowed this to unfold. And now here we are with this <laughs> digital ministry, and there you are, just participating as a full participant, uh, as you always have been. So you're one of our, you might say, as founders. You were right there at the, mm. at the beginning, and when it was just getting off the ground, you were in a little meeting over there at Charles' house saying, I'm in. What do you need? I'll give you whatever you need. You know, you were one of the founders that, that allowed this to start around 2009. I think the beginning of 2009 was when it was. So thank you, AC, because we feel you and you. I know what you're talking about. You're feeling it, the experience right now, what I've been feeling and talking about for these 25 years. Yeah. I was thinking maybe I could wrap up with just one more question with along the same lines and that's um, so when I was doing the first gathering that I was talking about there before we met with the residents you know we talked about doing clips we ended up playing the full movie but I felt when I was trying to talk to the, the participants so blank and and these ideas would come in about how to deal with specific steps or to work through the things that we'd been updated at at lunch. But it felt like there was a past, it was like past ideas, and when I would say it, it didn't have that super fresh feel. And yet they were, if I could say right, I don't, you have to <laughs> work with that. But it, but there was this like sinking in, and, and I actually ended up leaving the gathering, and Kirsten took it because I just couldn't figure out what, what my role is anymore. And I just thought, how does that line up with everything we've just talked about here? Because it feels like it lines up, you know, just yeah. a, something fresh or whatever, but. Yeah. 
No, I think it, if, you, if we could say Holy Spirit and Jesus are in charge of the plan of atonement, they're the ones that, you might say, dish out the roles. And even back to what you were talking about, the role of public speaking, you, you have, since that time years ago, you have done quite a bit of public speaking, especially with clips and movies, and now even more recently with your, your TV show and so forth. But I don't think any of that is really like a primary role for you still. Like I feel you're kind of like Ender in Ender's Game, and, and in the end there's a team of people around you that all have roles to play, and you're more like the, the symphony conductor, you know, that Ender had to be at the end of the Ender's Game movie. You know, he basically had to step into this position where he was, there were many people that he, he was part of a team that was doing something that, that was very given and very valuable, but it really wasn't a public, um, it wasn't a public uh, thing at all. It was, it was more of a, of a contained role that was very important and um, so perhaps that's really the feeling of like, if you're just watching the past and, and going blank, it's just a feeling of, okay, this is not for me. You know, it's, you were, you were just starting to just share a bit with uh, the overall context of things. But that is, I think, the extent of as far as the far reaches of your function go. Now you have to have faith in, in the ones, you know, that are coming under you. There's overseers that, that have important functions, and you just have to believe in them. All you have to do is have confidence and believe in them. That's the main thing that you have. Mm-hmm. And then there's going to be some communication involved there, but, but not so much as uh, much because the, these overseers will be communicating with those who are, who are above them that are designed to work on certain decisions and then things will, it's almost like a CEO of a company that there's not going to be out of a big company. There's not going to be tons and hundreds of, of messages and decisions that come across your desk. There's going to be more of a select few that make it to your awareness. And those are important for you because you have the faith and trust in what is going to bring them up to you. Mm-hmm. And then those will be the, the decisions where you pray and, and you'll make decisions like that. But I think that that's more of the role. That's more, it's, wow. it's a very simplified role and you, you don't want to try to over, overdo it or do more than the role that's given you because you'll feel fatigued if you, if you start to get into areas that really aren't yours anymore, you know, that you you know what they are because you've been through them before, but, but you're not to have your fingers too far out into too many pies. You know, you're just to kind of be loving, trusting, staying open with communication and, and listening, inner listening. And then when the things come across your desk, so to speak, you'll be ready for them, but it should be easy to just handle the ones that, uh, I thought I have this show. I wouldn't even learn all these things. <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> wow, this is... But you don't know. But you don't just know. watch Picard and, uh, and then that, will, that will give you a, a good idea of how it is in action. Picard is very focused, very loving, very gracious, full of integrity and... And he occasionally says, make it so, number one. And that's, that's just a, a great relationship to watch. You know, it's funny when you say it, because I feel something deep inside about that's not your role, like whether it's a part that still wants it in the future or so bizarre, like, but I really resonate with what you're saying. It's like, I could be good at it. You know? <laughs> but there's no healing, so... Wow, okay. Thank you, David. That's beautiful. Oh, you're very welcome. Always a joy. Yeah, thank you, everybody. For We never know what's going to happen because I don't know until the morning of. But (laughs) 
Thanks for joining in, and I guess we'll see you next week because there's the shows and then uh, the online retreat after that. So, love you all. <laughs>